Muy, muy buenas tardes. Eh, es un eh, placer el agradecerles el interés en este ciclo de conferencias y que nos eh, acompañen eh, para eh, eh, las eh, eh, conferencias sobre los diferentes temas que se han estado eh, preparando como parte de la organización de Fundación UNAM, el Colegio Nacional y un conjunto de, de universidades y centros de, de investigación. Eh, el día de hoy tenemos una conferencia eh, muy interesante sobre un tema que en los últimos meses nos ha preocupado, que es eh, la parte de la salud, y la conferencia está a cargo de la doctora Vicky Hunt, del de Centro Milner de Evolución de la Universidad de, de, de Bath. Eh, este ciclo de conferencias eh, eh, iniciado por Fundación y por el Colegio eh, se ha ido ampliando considerablemente y eh, tenemos ahora la participación de un grupo de, de universidades e instituciones de México y de otros lados, como vamos a, a, a ver en un momento, en un momento más. Eh, entonces, eh, a nombre de, de, de Fundación y del Colegio, es un placer el darles la bienvenida. Y eh, pasamos eh, la palabra al licenciado Dionisio Mid, que es eh, nuestro presidente de Fundación UNAM. Eh, muchas gracias. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias, Jaime. Eh, nuevamente subrayar que para Fundación UNAM es un privilegio estar presente en este ciclo de conferencias Universidades por las Ciencias. Como acaba de mencionar Jaime, este consorcio de universidades se integra por 14 instituciones hasta ahora de distintas partes del mundo y en las circunstancias actuales, cuando las dificultades de presenciales para la investigación y el desarrollo se nos presentan, surgen iniciativas como estas que nos vinculan a los investigadores, a los científicos, a los académicos desde muchas partes del mundo que quieren por esta vía compartir su conocimiento, compartir sus avances científicos y tecnológicos con todos quienes quieran participar en presentaciones que son abiertas. Las redes del Colegio Nacional, las redes de Fundación UNAM están abiertas y hemos encontrado con mucha satisfacción, con mucho orgullo, que son muchos quienes están siguiendo estas, estas participaciones, no solo en México, no solo en Inglaterra, sino en otras partes del mundo que se interesan también por el avance científico. Para nosotros es especialmente grato agradecer la iniciativa de Adaxi, la iniciativa de Jaime, de invitarnos a participar en este evento, que pone a la Fundación justo en el centro de sus objetivos, la investigación científica, la docencia y la difusión de la cultura. En este ciclo de conferencias se articulan los tres objetivos y para nosotros es motivo de gran orgullo y de gran satisfacción participar en este evento con la participación de Vicky de la Universidad de Bar, tenemos ya presencias, o hemos tenido ya presencias de la Universidad de Cardiff, de la Universidad de Cambridge, y tendremos de otros lugares. Y justamente esto nos está ilustrando la enorme capacidad que tienen estos medios en donde nos vinculamos sin reconocer fronteras, sin reconocer nacionalidades, sin, el, sin la frontera de los idiomas, para estar todos juntos tratando de aprender más y de conocer mejor. Este es realmente una muestra de convivencia, una muestra de articulación por el bien de la humanidad. Para nosotros como Fundación UNAM es motivo de especial orgullo y es motivo también de especial gratitud. Con Jaime, que es miembro del Colegio Nacional y que nos ha sumado este esfuerzo, es miembro a su vez de la Junta de Gobierno de la Universidad, que participa, participa activamente también en este consorcio y es, para orgullo nuestro, miembro del Consejo de Fundación UNAM. Araxi, tienes que sentirte muy orgullosa. Martín Serrano no, no está, le mandamos un abrazo y le damos la bienvenida a México a la distancia, a nuestra presentadora, a nuestra conferencista del día de hoy, a Vicky Hunt, que nos va a dirigir esta formidable presentación. Muchas gracias a todos y esperamos con mucho interés su presentación. Gracias a todos nuevamente. Eh, muchas gracias, licenciado Dionisio y presidente de Fundación UNAM, por estas eh, muy bonitas palabras. Eh, tiene usted toda la razón en esta 
época, pues cualquier esfuerzo que nos lleve a sumar esfuerzos es algo positivo y ojalá que más instituciones se sumen y que eh, más personas eh, nos acompañen en todos los eventos que se están organizando. Eh, si pudiera poner la diapositiva, por favor, acerca del consorcio. Eh, bueno, el Consorcio de Universidades por la Ciencia, the uh, Universities for Science Consortium, is uh, made up at the moment by uh, 14 different institutions from around the world, uh, from Mexico, from the UK and the US. And hopefully we will be able to um, gather more institutions that want to join forces with us um, in this effort to bring scientists together from around the world uh, to be able to share um, his, uh, their, well, their research with uh, other academics for research collaboration and also for um, uh, public engagement uh, in science. So, I would like to thank um, all the institutions that are part of this consortium and uh, I would particularly like to um, thank um, all the efforts by the uh, Center for um, Sci uh, Complexity Sciences from UNAM who have been really generous in sharing some of the events that they are organizing with us and even um, helping with some of the logistics on uh, the um, uh, part of uh, doing the logo and everything. Obviously, uh, our sincere um, uh, thanks go as well to Fundación UNAM and Colegio Nacional, who are making this um, seminar series uh, possible. Um, it is a great joy and a great space um, to share um, science uh, with everybody. So um, I would also like to welcome um, two new institutions have that have recently joined, um, ITAM and UDEM, uh, who are, uh, which are two um, uh, Mexican universities, and we very much look forward to uh, working with them um, in order to um, share the um, events that we are already organizing, but also to organize many more in the future. So I would um, also um, like to highlight um, the following um, talk um, for next uh, week on the 7th of July. This will be at the same time, so this is um, 12 o'clock, so midday, in uh, central Mexico uh, time and uh, 6 p.m. in the UK. So um, this talk will be by Chris Lowery from the University of Texas at Austin, and he will be talking about um, how life recovered after the uh, impact, the meteorite impact 66 uh, million years ago that marked the end of the Cretaceous uh, era. Um, so the um, what I would like to do now is just um, present our uh, speaker for today, um, Dr. Vicky Hunt. Um, I have the pleasure of knowing Vicky for quite a long time, um, as well as uh, Ma Martin Serrano, who couldn't uh, join us. So we both have known Vicky for the last 20 years. Um, we have the um, honor to have uh, been her teachers, um, although only as symbolic um, uh, and nominal uh, classes, uh, as we were both uh, uh, lab demonstrators rather than lecturers at the time. So Vicky did her undergrad degree and her PhD at the University of uh, Bath. And then um, she stayed as a research um, associate both at the University of Bristol and also at the University of Bath. And in 2016, um, she um, became an early career, uh, she got an early career uh, fellowship, which um, she held at the University of Bristol as well. And then she went all the way around the world. Um, so in 2017, she um, um, had a fellowship from uh, the Japanese Society for Promotion of Science and she was at uh, Miyazaki um, University in uh, Japan. So after um, this, we, it was a great pleasure to have her back 
at uh, the University of Bath once more. Uh, so she joined the academic staff in 2018 at the Milner Center for Evolution, which at the time was also brand new. So um, it was a, a great uh, start and a great omen to have her back for that. Um, so she's currently um, a Sir Henry Dale Wellcome Trust uh, Research Fellow, and she leads a lab in uh, nematode evolution and also nematode molecular evolution. So Vicky, it's an honor to have you here. Um, I'm really pleased that you could agree to give this talk and we very much look forward to what you have to say to us. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to start by just saying good afternoon to everyone. Um, and to say thank you to Araxi for such a lovely introduction. It's, uh, as she said, I did a full circle starting at Bath University all the way back again, and it's really great to be back there. Um, and I'd like to start by thanking the organisers for having me and inviting me to speak today. So I'm really happy to be online and to share some of my, my research on parasitic nematodes. So let me just share my screen. Um, Okay, so specifically today, I'm gonna to talk about the role of small RNAs in parasitism. And my parasite of choice is Strongyloides. So this is a, here you go, a picture of Strongyloides here. Strongyloides is a gastrointestinal nematode worm. It's a parasite of humans and other animals, including livestock. And in my lab, we work on Strongyloides ratti. So it's a parasite of rats. And this species is closely related to Strongyloides stercoralis, a human parasite. Uh, as well as being a well-established laboratory model. So here you have an image of a parasitic female that we've, we've recovered from the small intestine of a rat. And if you follow this QR code as well, this will take you to a video if you wanna have a look at the, a video of this worm as well. So I'm interested in this molecular and the genetic basis of parasitism. So what is the molecular toolbox used by these parasites to infect their host? And this includes the genes and the proteins and the small RNAs amongst other things. And I'm interested in both the molecules that act endogenously within the parasite and those that are produced by the parasite, but then are secreted out into the host, for example, in vesicles and target aspects of the host biology. And today I'm gonna to particularly focus on the small RNA pathways. So here's an outline of my presentation today. I'm gonna to start with, I have one side of my background. I'd just like to introduce you to, my, to me and what I've, I've done previously. I think Araxi has already touched on this, but I'll go into a little bit more detail. And then the rest of the talk are divided up into two sections. So half will be an introduction to Strongyloides, and I'll tell you a little bit about Strongyloides genomics and genetics. This is mostly based on the work I did as a postdoc. And then the last half of the talk will be on the role of small RNAs in parasitism. And this is ongoing work. So this is a work in progress. So I'd like to show you what we've done so far in this area. So here's a little bit about my background. So as Araxi said, I uh, started at the University of Bath where I did my undergraduate degree and my PhD. And here's a picture of Bath here. So this is a city in the Southwest of England. And my PhD was on infections in insects. So I work, worked on fungal infections of locusts and um, also of, uh, of Drosophila fruit flies. After my PhD, I actually switched fields and started working in parasitology and nematode biology. So I moved to the University of Bristol, which is about, about 15 minutes on the train from Bath. And I moved to Professor Mark Viney's lab, who he's, uh, was at University of Bristol at the time, has now moved to the University of Liverpool. And I was a postdoc here for around three and a half years. And this is where I first started working on nematodes and particularly this worm Strongyloides, this parasite. I knew immediately that this was what I wanted to spend the rest of my career working on. And hopefully I'll convince you today why they're so interesting. And then after three and a half years as a postdoc, I then uh, stayed on for a further year in Mark's lab uh, as an EBI Wellcome Trust Fellow. I then moved across to Japan where I had a, a JSBS fellowship and that was hosted by Professor Taizu Kikuchi. And I continued to work on Strongyloides genetics in his lab as well. I also slightly branched out and started working on free living nematodes too. And this one in particular, this is C. inopinata. So it's the closest known relative of C. elegans. And I still do a little bit of work on that nematode as well. But mostly I focused on Strongyloides. So after 18 months in Japan, I then moved back to the University of Bath and started up my own research group. 
And here's a, a picture of us here. So this is me here. And uh, I have a Sir Henry Dale Fellowships, so Wellcome Trust and Royal Society Fellowship for five years. And in the lab, we all work on different aspects of strongyloides biology, particularly genetics and small RNAs. So I've told you a little bit about myself, and now I'd like to introduce you to strongyloides. So strongyloides are part of a class of parasites called the soil transmitted helminths. They're so called because of a soil phase in their life cycle, and I'll discuss this more in the next slide. And these soil transmitted helminths are estimated to infect one and a half billion people globally. And it's been estimated by the WHO that their disease burden measured by the years lost due to disability is five million years. And to give you some context on this, this is actually greater than the uh, disease burden that's estimated for HIV and AIDS or malaria. And as such, the, the WHO have actually classified the soil transmitted helminths as a neglected tropical disease. So we need to do more research on these, these widespread parasites. So I, I'm interested in this, in particularly in strongyloides parasites, and these, like other soil transmitted helminths, are gastrointestinal parasites. Strongyloides actually lives in the small intestine, so it actually burrows into the mucosa of the small intestine and lives there as an adult. And there's two species that are parasites of humans. One is Strongyloides stercoralis, and I'll show you a picture, a video here of a, of a parasitic worm. So Strongyloides stercoralis is the most widespread and is found across sort of tropical and subtropical regions of the world. Another human parasite is Strongyloides bulaborni, which is mostly found in Papua New Guinea. And this causes, particularly causes a disease in children called swollen belly syndrome. And here again, just another image of this is a parasitic female uh, laying an egg here. And these are about two millimeters in size at the adult stage. So I'm just gonna go over briefly how these worms infect people and infect other hosts as well. So you have a, a, one part of the life cycle is free living. And these worms live in the environment. They normally live around somewhere where there's a water source because they need to swim through the water. And they, when they come in contact with a the host, they can actually burrow directly through the skin. So this is at a larval stage and these larvae are about half a millimeter in size. So you might be walking along and uh, normally your foot would be the, the part of your body that would come into contact with them. They would burrow directly through the skin they then make their way through your body and they'd make their way towards your lungs. Once in your lungs, they actually irritate the lungs and you end up coughing them up into your mouth. And then you swallow them back down and that's how they make their way into your intestine. And this is where they develop as adults. So the, they live in the intestine and they, uh, they lay eggs and the eggs leave the body in the feces and this enters back into the environment. And this, this is how these worms trans, transmit. So they, these eggs then develop back into larvae. And so the trans, cycle of transmission continues. So you might want to know why are we interested in understanding the sort of molecular and the genetic basic of, basis of these parasites? So from my point of view, just understanding the biology of how these hosts and the parasites interact together is fascinating on its own. But also, if we can understand how these parasites can infect their host, so how they can avoid detection by their host, how they can get inside their host, and how they can actually manipulate their host immune system for their own benefit, we can actually use this information potentially to treat things like autoimmune diseases, for example, Crohn's and colitis, where you have an overactive immune system in the gut. So if we know how a worm can, can um, suppress your immune response, perhaps we can develop this in ways that would benefit us. And also, the more we understand about these parasites, the more information we have that we can use towards developing ways to control and to treat both the populations of these worms and the disease that they cause. So I want to talk to you a little bit more about the life cycle. Um, so for someone like me, who's a parasitologist and a geneticist, the strongyloides have one particular feature of their life cycle that makes them very, very nice to work with in the lab. And this is that they have a genetically identical adult parasitic stage and, paras and, and a free living adult stage. So this is quite unique amongst parasites, but can be really useful when you're trying to understand what makes a parasite a parasite. And so to explain this, I'm gonna go through the life cycle in a little more detail. So you have these infective larvae stage. So this is the stage that can burrow through the skin and infect you. And these uh, get to the gut where they develop as adults. 
And these adults, the parasite adults, they're all female. These parasitic adult females, they reproduce through mitotic parthenogenesis. And their eggs leave the, leave the host, and then they may develop in one of two ways. So either the eggs develop directly into larvae, so through some, some intermediary larval stages, and these larvae then go and affect a new host, or they may develop into free-living adult males and females. And the offspring of these, these re reproduce sexually, their offspring then become IL-3s that go and infect a new host. So here's a parasitic female and here's a free-living female. Now importantly, because the parasitic female reproduces through parthenogenesis, these two stages are genetically identical. So what we do in the lab is we take, um, we extract these parasitic adults from the small intestine of rats, and we culture the free living adults in rat feces. And we can make a direct comparison between these two life cycle stages. So if we're asking questions about what makes the parasite a parasite, which genes or proteins or small RNAs are important in being a parasite, we can directly compare the ones that the, these molecules in the parasitic stage and the free living stage. So for example, which genes are upregulated in the parasitic stage compared with the free living stage? And that can give us clues about which genes or proteins, for example, might be important in parasitism. <clears throat> so as a postdoc, I was interested in, in these parasitic worms. And to give you a little bit more context about where these worms sit in terms of nematode evolution. So, there's, so nematodes are normally split into five evolutionary clades. And here, this phylogeny represents four of these five clades. And you can find strongyloides in clade four. So here you might be familiar with Cenorhabditis elegans, C. elegans, the model organism. And uh, a number of these other species are parasitic. So as a postdoc, I was interested in these, this strongyloides um, group of nematodes. And I worked on four species of strongyloides. So four here, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. And two closely related species, one that was a parasitic a parasitic relative called parastrongyloides and a free living relative as well called rhabditophanes. And what we, we, we know about, or at least the evidence suggests in nematodes is the ancestry strait of nematodes is free living. So parasitism has evolved in nematodes a number of times from a free living ancestor. And I was interested in how, how parasitism has, had evolved in these worms and which genes and proteins might be important for them. So here's, this is a zoomed in version of these, um, these six worms that I was working on. And we've got, so you've got the four strongyloides species here, and two of these are parasites of rats. Uh, one is a parasite of humans, and one is a parasite of livestock, such as sheep. And then you have this closely related parasite called parastrongyloides, which is a parasite of possums, and has a couple of differences in its life cycle. For example, it has male and female parasites. And it can also have, have multiple generations of the free living stage, which strongyloides can't. And then you have this free living nematode as well. So what we know is that um, so evolution uh, uh, the evolution of parasitism has happened somewhere around here. And then again, the evolution of strongyloides parasitism has evolved around here. And so I was interested in finding out uh, what was happening, what was the difference between these different nematodes in terms of their molecular and genetic biology. So what we did was uh, in collaboration with, this is when I worked at, in Professor Mark Viney's lab and in collaboration with other, other labs around the world, including uh, Matt Berryman's lab in the Sanger Center and Jonathan Wassling's lab, um, at, who's now at the University of Kiel. We looked at uh, the, the genomes and we sequenced the genomes of all six species. So there was at the time no, no strongyloides genomes available. And we found that these genomes were around 42 to 60 megabases in size. And to give you some context, context, that's quite small for a nematode. So C. elegans is around 100 megabases. And we predicted around 12 and a half to 18 and a half thousand protein coding genes in each of these genomes. So we spent a lot of effort assembling these, uh, these genomes, and particularly Strongyloides ratti's genome. So we wanted to try and get it to a, a, a standard, close to sort of the standard that you see in C. elegans. So we actually managed to assemble this into two, um, into two autosomes and its X chromosome. The two autosomes are uh, full, full length scaffolds and the X chromosome is split into 10 large scaffolds. So this actually made it the most contiguously assembled genome of any parasitic nematode. And at the time only second to C. elegans in terms of genome assembly quality. 
So we have really good data to work with in these worms. I then went on and wanted to look at the transcriptome and the proteome of these worms. And I've, been, I've looked at the, um, the, the parasitic stages in these four species compared with the free living stages of these species and directly compared the genes and the proteins that were present and expressed. And what we found was that there was a subset of genes and proteins that are upregulated in the parasitic and the free living stages. So here are the, oops, sorry. So here are your four, the four strongyloidy species. And these pie charts represent, these are the total number of protein coding genes in the genome. And the red and blue represent the proportion of these genes that are differentially expressed. So the red are the genes that are, the number of genes that are upregulated in the parasitic stage, and the blue is the free living stage. So overall, we found that around 10 to 18 percent of these genes are differentially expressed, and we uh, we can hypothesize that the genes that are upregulated in the parasitic stage have a putative role in parasitism, or at least something relating to the parasitic life stage. We also found that around 500 proteins were, were, um, were present in each of these stages, and we used quantitative proteomics to look at this. So from this, we could summarize uh, by comparing these parasitic and free living stages, we could summarize which gene families or protein families seem to be important. What we found was overall in the free living stage, there were many different gene and protein families but belonging to very diverse groups that were upregulated this stage. So for example, you might get a few genes from a family that were upregulated in the stage and a few more from another family, et cetera. In the parasitic stage, the pattern was quite different. So we found there were fewer, fewer key families, but these families may have 60 or 80 gene mem members in that fam gene family. And, and here's, here's a list of some of the most of the most commonly found, the ones that also have the highest levels of expression. And uh, I'm going to refer to these as parasitism genes. So genes that genes and proteins that we think are probably have a role in parasitism based on this evidence. And so I've just picked out one example from this list of, of protein coding gene families uh, to give you an example of how it might be working. So one thing to note as well is a lot of these, these gene and protein families, the proteins are actually also secreted at the parasitic stage. So secreted out of the worm into the host. So we can predict that maybe they're actually interacting with the host as well. So one group we found was the acetylcholine esterases. And so most people will be familiar with the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And it's been found in, as well as strongyloides, other gastrointestinal worms also seem to express the genes for these, these um, acetylcholine esterases and secrete the proteins into their host. Now, in the host, what, what we know that it's acetylcholine is involved is, with is regulating peristalsis, so the movement of the gut, and also the release of mucosa in the gut. And during an infection of a parasitic worm inside the gut, the end point where the host can actually expel the worm from, the, from its gut is when it increases things like peristalsis and mucosa production. And that's how it gets rid of the worm. So what we, we've hypothesized here is that it is uh, making these acetylcholine esterases and secreting them out into the host gut. And actually this is interfering with the peristalsis and mucosa production to the benefit of the worm. So the worm can actually survive for longer inside the gut. So that's what our, our sort of running hypothesis is on this. And there are other protein coding families as well. That's the, there's some evidence that they're actually interacting directly with the immune system of the host as well. So from this work, we've identified three key features that are associated with these parasitism genes. So one of these is the expression of these genes seems to increase as infection progresses. So here you've got along the x-axis, these are the days post-infection. So days during the infection. So we sampled at day seven, 12, 17, and 22 days after initial infection and the parasitic worms. And for free living worms, which only live for about five or six days, uh, we sampled them at day one, three, and four. And these are the ones that live in the feces. And we, we looked at um, these, we looked at many different gene families, but these ones in particular are the gene families that are associated with parasitism. And of these gene families, they had a very distinct pattern that was unlike other gene families. So if we picked a gene family at random, we didn't see this pattern. 
So we find that they increase during infection. As infection progresses, their expression levels shown on the y-axis actually increase as well. So this is one feature we found that was associated with these parasitism genes. The second feature we found was that the parasitism gene families have expanded in strongyloides. So gene families, again, such as the estacins, SCP-TAPs, and acetylcholine esterases have expanded. And we also know that these are probably important for parasitism. So in the, um, so there's a slightly different color scheme between the, these, these um, phylogenies here. So in the first two here, the strongyloides ratty genes are shown in blue. So these are all of the strongyloides ratty genes uh, from the estacin family and for the SCP-TAP family. And then genes from other, other nematode worms are shown in different colors. And you can see here that there's a massive expansion of, of astacins and STP-TAPs. And similarly in acetylcholine esterases, although the color scheme is different here, so you've got, these are actually all four um, strongyloides species and parastrongyloides, the close related parasite is shown in red and orange here. And compared with a number of other parasite species that only have maybe two or three copies of these genes in their genome. And you see, see again, this massive expansion of this, this gene family. So the third, uh, the third feature that we found associated with these parasitism genes, is that they seem to be physically clustered within the genome. So here you've got, if you look at, uh, so these are the two autosomes and the X chromosome from strongyloides. And if you look on the Y axis, this is just proportion of genes. So if we take all of the genes in the genome and we have a look across the, the, the two, three chromosomes, we can see that these genes are distributed fairly evenly, maybe slightly lower in the X chromosome, but overall fairly evenly. Then if we take the genes that are specifically associated with either the parasitic female stage, the adult that lives in the gut, the infective larvae stage, or the free living females, we can see that there's a different pattern. So IL3 shown in green and the free living females shown in blue uh, don't show much of a, of a distribution pattern. They're fairly evenly spread across the genome. However, if we look at the parasitic female, so in, shown in red here, in chromosome two particularly, there are these key hotspots where we seem to get clusters and enrichment for these genes involved in parasitism. So that's a sort of overview of my work that I did as a postdoc, looking at the genes that are involved and the proteins that are involved in strongyloides parasitism. So then a couple of years ago, I started wondering and thinking about how the, these, um, the expression of these parasitism genes is regulated. And we started looking at small RNAs. And so for the second part of this talk, this is what I will focus on. <clears throat> so first of all, I'll just give you a very simplified overview of, of what a small RNA does and, what it, and how it works. So you have these small RNA molecules. They're around maybe 18 to 30 nucleotides long. And they bind to a protein complex. And this protein complex includes a protein called the argonaut protein. And these argonaut proteins are essential in small RNA pathways. And you have, uh, in nematodes particularly, have a lot of argonaut proteins. And each argonaut protein seems to be associated with a particular type of small RNA. So it might be a microRNA or it might be a particular class of small interfering RNA. What happens is this, this RNA protein complex is also bound to a, a target gene. So in this case, a messenger RNA, and it could be at any part, uh, bind to any part of the gene. So it could be in the UTR regions, so that's the untranslated regions, or it could be in a coding region. And in doing so, it actually either leads to degradation of the target, so, or, or an inhibition of translation, but ultimately it stops the messenger RNA being turned into a protein. So it in, inhibits translation or represses trans, uh, transcription. And I'm interested in the role that these small RNAs have in parasitism. And so there's actually two different ways that these small RNAs could have a role. So firstly, they might regulate the expression of genes involved in parasitism. And by that, I mean endogenous genes. So I mean, they might regulate the parasite's own genes. And secondly, they might be secreted into the host where they actually regulate the host gene expression. And I'm gonna talk about both of these today. So I'll start with the endogenous small RNA pathways. So again, what I mean by this is you might have a small RNA that's, that's coded for in the worm genome. And this may target a gene also coded for in the worm genome. And then by in doing so actually uh, regulate the expression of this gene. 
And this gene may or may not encode for a protein that uh, could be secreted out of the host and could have a direct role in parasitism, or it might be a protein that is also uh, endogenously maintained within the nematode. And so what we did was we, we sequenced the small RNAs from the parasitic stage and the free living stage, as I, as I described previously, and we compared these. So this is a, a small RNA profile for the, for the strongyloides ratti, uh, for the parasitic females and these free living females, which are genetically identical. So on the y-axis, these are reads per million, so there's just the, the amount of the small RNA. And on the x-axis, you have the, uh, the size of the small RNA. Um, so you can see here that there's, uh, so they range here about roughly between sort of 18 and 30 um, nucleotides in length. And we've classified each of these, these sizes of the small RNA into, um, into different types of, of small RNA, depending on uh, certain features in their sequence or similarities. So for example, we have microRNA shown in light blue. You can see they're present in both of these and uh, siRNA, so small interfering RNAs, which are shown in green. And you can see that these are the most abundant in both cases. And these are the ones that I'm gonna focus on today. And we used um, uh, two different library preparations to do this. So small RNAs have different modifications on, on the ends of, their, of these RNA molecules. So depending on that, we actually use two different methods for looking at them. So we could try and encompass as many small RNAs and types of small RNAs as we could. Uh, so our, and at first glance, actually, if you look at the free living females and the parasitic females, it doesn't seem like there's a huge difference. They actually look pretty similar to each other. But we wanted to look in more detail and actually look at not just the pattern of, of, of small RNAs shown here, but also look at the sequences and see if we can understand what the differences are between them. So I've split this into microRNAs and the siRNAs. So we'll start with microRNAs. So microRNAs target uh, messenger RNA, and they're, they're very conserved. They're found um, in many different organisms. And what we did was we took all of the microRNA sequences, and these were predicted using some software called MerDeep2, which, is, which looks at uh, the sequence of the microRNA and also looks for its precursor sequence as well. So it looks for characteristics that are typical of a microRNA. And we plotted this, so we're showing the log fold change on the y-axis between the parasitic stage and the free living stage. And along the x-axis, this is counts per million. So it's just the amount of that small RNA that was present. And each, each data point here represents a single microRNA sequence. So if we look at these expression levels, we found that there were, were lots shown in, green, in gray that are not differentially expressed. So they're expressed at a similar level in parasitic and free living worms but we also found some that were significantly different. So that those that in red are significantly upregulated in the parasitic stage, and those shown in blue were significantly upregulated in the free living stage. So these are the microRNAs that could potentially be involved in parasitism or regulating the genes that are involved in parasitism. So we also thought, as well as looking at the individual sequences of microRNAs, we wanted to look at something called the seed sequence. So on a microRNA, which is around 22 nucleotides in length, you have a sequence which is, which is around seven nucleotides, and this is called the seed sequence. And this is actually the sequence that complements its target. So we can use this to, to potentially predict which genes it's targeting. And this seed sequence is, um, is conserved in, and there are many different families that have been identified and, and many that we're still, still learning about and identifying now. So, and many of the seed sequences that are similar, these microRNAs are also targeting uh, similar groups and types of genes. So what I've done here is we've, we've got two replicates for parasitic female, two replicates for free living female, and we've ordered these microRNAs by their seed sequence. So starting with A's and going down to U's. And what we found is that certain seed sequences, so for example, I've taken this one here, UUGCGAC, this seed sequence seems to show a, a stage specific expression pattern. So in this case, yellow means that it's highly expressed and red means that it's lowly expressed. And we find that this seed sequence is, they, they seem to be very highly expressed in the parasitic female. So it seems that as well as finding individual microRNAs and sequences that are important in parasitism, we can also identify families of microRNAs based on their seed sequence. 
And this, this um, implies some kind of coordinated regulation as well um, of, of genes. They're probably targeting genes that are also very similar to each other. And that leads me on to the next stage in our project. And this is something that we're currently in the, the process of working towards. So what do these microRNAs actually target? What are the genes inside the nematode that they're targeting? One of the problems with doing this bioinformatically is that because you only have this very small seed sequence of seven nucleotides, you get a lot of false positives. So if you look where, look where that sequence is, is complementary in the genome, you'll find lots of false positives. Another problem is that we don't have very good annotated UTR regions of genes. And this is something we're currently doing. So uh, one of the PhD students in the lab, Dominique Elastic, is currently sequencing the UTR regions so that we can get a better idea of actually what's happening in the genes themselves. And this will help us predict what genes are being targeted. And then we also are taking an experimental approach, which we're just in the process of starting. Um, and this is, uh, so a, a, a postdoc who's just joined our lab, Rebecca Pollock, will be working on ClipSeq and developing ClipSeq to look at uh, these, the targets of these, these microRNAs in the, in the lab. And the way we do this is so we've raised uh, antibodies uh, here to, uh, against this argonaut protein, the argonaut protein that we know is involved in a particular small RNA pathway. And then we pull down this protein and attached to it is the small RNA and the, the RNA that it's targeting. And then we can sequence that RNA so we can get a much better idea of what's being targeted. So that's currently a work in progress. So next I'll talk about the siRNAs that are involved in these endogenous pathways. So similar to the graph before for microRNAs, we've looked at the siRNAs. So we've got, again, the log fold change and uh, the amount of the R small RNA, this is siRNA, so small interfering RNA. And statistically, we found that some of these are differentially expressed. So these red ones are significantly upregulated in the parasitic stage, and the blue ones are significantly upregulated in the free living stage. And these are the ones we are interested in and think that they could potentially have a role in parasitism. So with siRNAs, the, the, the first couple of ways of starting to classify these types of small RNAs is to one, look at their sequence, uh, uh, sequence length, so how long are they? And to secondly, to look at the first nucleotide that they start with. So we took all of these red ones and all of these blue sequences and we plotted them here. So we, we wanted to see the proportion of reads and what size they were. And you can see that there's a really clear pattern with the parasitic stage. So we have a, a peak at 21 and 22. And when we looked at this in more detail, almost all of them started with a U. So we found this, this class of siRNAs is 21 and 22 U's that seem to be import, uh, have some uh, significance in parasitism or something related to this parasitic lifestyle. And then we wanted to uh, predict what these might be targeting. Oh, sorry, but actually before I go on to that, I just, the other thing I was, we did was we looked at how these, these small RNAs are distributed along the genome. So one of the advantages of working with strongyloides is that we have this really well assembled genome. So this means that we have uh, these full scaffolds for chromosome one, chromosome two, and then 10 big scaffolds for chromosome X. This means that we can look along the distribution and we found that if we take all of those, those siRNAs that are not differentially expressed, we find that they're distributed along the genome and they have a couple of peaks on the X chromosome. Again, if we do the same for these, the, these siRNAs upregulated in the parasitic stage or the free living stage, we find that there's not really much of a pattern on the free living, um, for the free living siRNA, but we've seen this strong cluster of siRNAs that are upregulated in the parasitic female and are based on the X chromosome. So again, further implying that these are an important sort of SI or a, a class of siRNA. They certainly follow some pa similar patterns to each other. So we took these siRNA sequences and we wanted to look at what they were, what they were targeting. So what nematode genes do they target? And so this is a, a gene ontology analysis. This is work, ongoing work from one of the PhD students in the lab, Mona Suleiman, and she's been looking at what genes these target. And um, what we found is when we did a GO analysis on these genes, um, that they seem to target a whole range of, of things. So all sorts of things, particularly involved in uh, metabolic processes and catalytic activity, but nothing really that clear. It seemed to be a whole range of things. 
And I should also mention, actually, when you when we look at targets of siRNA, we can do this bioinformatically because unlike microRNAs, where they have this small seed sequence, the whole of the siRNA sequence should complement its target. So we can use that whole sequence. So we can actually get a really good estimate of what they're targeting. So in addition to looking at the genes they're targeting, we know that some siRNAs, for example, in C. elegans and other species, they target transposable elements. So we looked at, and we had two different library preparations, and we identified which of these small RNAs uh, were from different classes, depending on if they had a monophosphate modification or a triphosphate modification. So these are well-known um, well classes of small RNAs. And we use this sequence to predict um, if they were targeting a, a transposable element. Actually, we found that they were. So actually, they, we found that several hundred of these small RNAs would direct that are significantly upregulated in the parasitic stage and a few that are regulated in the free living stage were actually targeting uh, transposable elements and not just any it seemed to be a real bias depending on the type of siRNA whether they were targeting for instance an LTR or a DNA transposon and here you can see the breakdown here of this as well as so this is ongoing work that we're, we're going we're, we're going to investigate further So I talked to you about the small RNAs that are endogenous. So small RNAs are targeting the, the parasite's own genes. But now I want to talk to you about some of the small RNAs that are also being secreted by these worms. So by that I mean, for example, siRNAs or microRNAs that are secreted directly out of the worm into the host. And as I'll go on to show you that we think that these, at least in part, are, are transported by vesicles. And as well as the small RNAs, I'm also gonna introduce you to the argonaut proteins as well. These are proteins that, that I mentioned are important in the small RNA pathways. So we, we, get these, we take these parasitic worms and we culture them and we, we take everything that they're secreting out into, their, into the media that they're, they're being cultured in. And what we found, and this is a collaborative work with uh, Kazu Murasa at the University of Kyoto. We found that these, uh, these worms are secreting vesicles, exosome-like vesicles, and you can see an image here. So this, these were secreted by, by uh, Strongyloides ratti, and also other Strongyloides species as well that we've looked at. And we did two things. So we took the protein from these vesicles and we took the RNA. So first of all, we looked at the proteins and we found that these vesicles are packed full of peptidases, particularly some of the peptidases and that we discussed earlier in these, these gene families protein families that are significantly upregulated in the parasitic stage. So for example, the metalloendopeptidases, which represent astacins. So then we, we further investigated the RNA. So we took, uh, took the RNA out of these vesicles, we extracted that and we prepared a small RNA library kit and we sequenced these small RNAs. And this is the results here of one of the replicates and the replicates are very similar. Uh, so what we find is, that we mostly have, and this is similar to the previous graph, so we have reads per million, so this is the amount of the small RNA, and this is the size of the small RNA along the x-axis. And what we find is we predominantly have small interfering RNAs packed in these vesicles. So we seem to have these little vesicles that are secreted out by these nematodes, they're packed full of peptidases and small RNAs and thrown out into the host. So of course we wanted to investigate what was going on here, what are these small RNAs? So we looked for, in this case, we actually looked to see what these siRNAs might be targeting in the host. So we looked at the rat host genes and we tried to predict what the targets were based on this perfect complementarity between the siRNA sequence and the host. And we found, we did some uh, a sort of enrichment analysis trying to understand what type of genes these were, but it, generally speaking, we didn't find um, much information from this, a so very vague sort of go terms that were significant. So we started looking at actually what these proteins, uh, the proteins that were coded for by these genes in, were, were doing. So some of these small RNAs are actually targeting estrogen receptors. And so at first glance, not knowing much about estrogen receptors, I didn't really understand the relevance of this. But after having a look into this a little bit more, we've discovered that estrogen receptors are actually really important in the gut. When they're expressed in the gut, they're involved in uh, mucus production. And as I mentioned earlier, this is really essential for the host. If the host wants to get rid of its, this parasitic worm inside its gut, it needs to increase its mucus production. 
So we're hypothesizing that actually these the small RNAs that are secreted out by these nematodes are actually directly targeting the estrogen receptors for their own benefit. So if they can reduce the amount of mucus that's produced, it actually means that they could survive longer in, inside the gut in theory. And we also found that, it was, that these small RNAs were targeting aspects of the immune system. So for example, the complement system. And so we also think that some of these small RNAs are targeting parts of the immune system, parts of the immune system that would normally be involved in the anti-nematode response. So again, for the own benefit of the parasite. So lastly, I just want to talk about briefly about the, the uh, um, as well as the small RNAs, these proteins that are also involved in small RNA pathways. So this is a phylogeny and there's a lot of information here. So I'll just point out the, 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 sort of the pieces of information that are uh, interesting. So this is a phylogeny of all the genes coding for proteins called argonauts. And these are the argonauts that the small RNAs are loaded onto and um, that also bind to the, um, the uh, interact with the target as well. And uh, for all these different nematodes, uh, we've got 14 species here and the strongyloides ones are shown in blue and dark blue. These closely related species that I mentioned earlier, the parastrongyloides and the rhabditophanes are shown in light blue. And you can see uh, the, the C. elegans um, uh, argonauts are shown by name. So we've, we've shown the name of these. So for example, these ones are involved in the microRNA pathway. Um, and you can see that most of the other nematodes, including strongyloides, also have copies of these genes and proteins. But then if you look here, so these, these ones that have a red star on top, these are actually significantly upregulated in the parasitic stage compared with the free living stage in, the, in, the, in gene expression. And uh, here's an example here. So this is one of these, these genes that code for, for an argonaut. And this is the different stages of the life cycle in strongyloides. And in the uh, parasitic female, you can see that's significantly upregulated. And that was actually the case for a whole cluster of them in all four strongyloide species that we tested. And these, these code for a WAGO. So this is a worm specific argonaut. These ones are only actually found in, in uh, nematodes. And WAGOs are known to bind to siRNA. So as well as being upregulated in the parasitic stage, we also know these, these same proteins are secreted out into the host. Uh, so you've got these, um, these small RNAs are secreted into the host and also a protein involved in small RNA pathway also secreted out into the host. And we're going to investigate these further. So what we don't understand at the moment is if these small RNAs from the nematode parasite are being secreted into the host and targeting host genes, how, are they at, how is that small, small RNA pathway actually working? So are they hijacking some of the rat, the host pathway components in their small RNA pathways? Or are, as it suggests here, they're actually sending in their own proteins as well? So I just want to summarize, I've got four sort of main points to summarize what I've been talking about today. So strongyloides are gastrointestinal parasites of humans and other animals. And we found that small RNAs, both microRNAs and siRNA, small interfering RNA, are upregulated in the parasitic stage. And the siRNA we've predicted target both endogenous nematode genes and transposable elements. So siRNAs we've also found are secreted into the, into the host by uh, in, in vesicles, exosome-like vesicles. And these seem to be targeting things involved in the genes involved in the anti-nematode response in the rat. So for example, the estrogen receptors and the complement pathway. And finally, also that these WAGO argonaut proteins involved in the siRNA or in, in a siRNA pathway we predict are also secreted out by these parasitic nematodes. So I just wanted to finish off by telling you what I think are some of the real advantages of working with strongyloides in the lab. So it might not be a nematode that you're particularly familiar with or a parasite that you're particularly familiar with. But we have these genetically identical parasitic and free living stages, which lend themselves really well to doing really exciting experimental work and genetics in the lab. We've got high quality genomes, um, genomes that we're continuously trying to improve the assembly of and get it closer and closer to being completely assembled. And also it's one of the few nematodes you can actually do genetic manipulation such as CRISPR-Cas9 as well. 
So it's definitely, if, if, if you're thinking about uh, working in parasitology or you're trying to decide a future career in biology, I would definitely recommend thinking about parasitology and parasitic limitants. And I just wanted to end um, with the, just before my acknowledgement slide, I just wanted to also advertise that we now have uh, funding for a meeting in, which will hopefully go ahead in January, 2021 in London. Um, sorry, not in London, but in the UK. And this is a meeting on, uh, specifically about strongyloides nematodes. This is the first one that we, that's, ever, that's ever gone ahead. And our goal of this meeting is to bring together the academic communities and also the medical communities that work on strongyloides and to discuss our research and to find out how we can work together. So I invite anybody that's interested to, to try and join us for that. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge, so as well as my funding, um, so the, the first part of the talk, so the genomic, the transcriptome and the proteomic work was work that I did in Mark Viney's lab. He's now at the University of Liverpool and in collab collaboration with the Sanger Centre and uh, what was Jonathan, who was at the University of Liverpool, now at Keele University. This small RNA and exosome work is an ongoing collaboration with Taizé Kikuchi and Kazunori Murasa from the University of Miyazaki and the University of Kyoto. And also uh, my lab group as well. So this is the lab here. So we're all working on different, different aspects of strongyloides. Uh, Mona is working on the, uh, some of the work we presented today, the strongyloides ratty small RNA project. Dominica is working on small RNAs in uh, another species of strongyloides, strongyloides venus valensis. Uh, Becky has recently joined the lab and is working on um, doing the experimental work on, on strongyloides and uh, small RNAs and what they might be targeting. And Pamela pretty much works on everything and all the projects and helps us maintain all of the strongyloides colonies and cultures. And the, uh, some of the transposable element work has been done is an ongoing project with Anna Protasio from the University of Cambridge. So I'd like to thank you all for listening and welcome any questions. So many thanks for that uh, fantastic talk, Vicky. Um, we have a few questions. So the first one is um, for the uh, parasitic uh, nematodes, um, do they require the um, parasitic um, stage? Is that a requirement of their life cycle? And if it is, how long can they um, live or exist as a free living um, in their free living stage? Yeah, so so the parasitic, they uh, obligate parasitic, so they do have to have a parasitic stage. Um, the closely related species, Parastrongyloides, doesn't actually, so that would have multiple free living generations. No, it wasn't. running around. Yeah, they um, they, they, yeah, they have to have a parasitic phase of their life cycle, so generation as a parasite inside the host. And these worms live for, in a normal, um, normal say, rat host, they live for maybe a month. Um, an immunocompromised host, they could actually live for up to a year. Then the free living worms, they live for around five days. So they live for a much shorter amount of time. Okay, so we have another question um, as to whether they are affected by um, environmental conditions uh, while they are in their free living uh, stage. Yeah, um, so as uh, they are in fact affected by environmental conditions, for example, things like temperature. So if we cultured them in the lab at different temperatures, we could actually get different sex ratios as well. So more males or females, depending on the temperature that we um, that we kept them at. They also um, they're also influenced by conditions inside the host as well. So depending on the host immune response. So if the host immune response is stronger or lower, they might actually develop more, be more likely to develop directly into parasites or into the free living stages. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Victor Hugo del Rio Raiza. He's asking um, if the, in the in vivo model, have you observed whether the gender of the host, male or female, can influence the expression of the genes that you're studying? Um, so that's, yeah, that's really interesting actually. So we, so in my lab at the moment and previously when I've worked on strongyloides, we've always used female rat hosts. Um, but actually something I'd really like to see in the future is actually comparing the males and female hosts. One reason, well, one reason it's just interesting from a biological point of view, from a sort of understanding the evolution of these host-parasite interactions 
Another reason is for reducing the number of animals in research. So it's really important that if we can use, um, if, 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 for example, we found that males and females had no difference, we could use these interchangeably. And I think that overall that would be better. Okay, so um, a somewhat related um, question to gender, but this time looking at the gender of the parasites. Um, so you mentioned that in several of these species, in, if I understood correctly, um, it is the female that has this parasitic um, um, stage. Um, why do you think this uh, gender difference evolved? Uh, and do you think it might be um, a common first stage into becoming, uh, adopting a parasite, um, a parasitic lifestyle in other species? Yeah, it, yeah, it could be. Um, so, so the strongyloides are uh, they're in clade four of, of nematodes, and this the sort of next clade over is clade five, which includes C. elegans. So, obviously, we know much more about C. elegans than we do other nematodes. Um, and a lot of the life cycle features of the particularly the free living stages are analogous or have at least some similarity to C. elegans. So, possibly that's left over from um, existing the ancestry state of, of existing as free living worms that then evolved into parasitism. The, so strongyloides only have these, the parasitic stages, female only, and but closely related species and other parasitic nematodes also, some of those have a male and female parasitic stage. So it seems to be a particular feature of strongyloides. So even the closely related parasite, parastrongyloides has male and female parasites. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know really. I think actually there's a there's a lot of scope here to investigate um, investigate this in more detail where you could look at so you have these genetically identical females one reproduces through parthenogenesis um, and it's obviously parasitic and the other one reproduces through sexual reproduction and actually there's a huge scope to under, if you want to understand the differences between parthenogenesis and sexual reproduction we could also use the same sort of comparisons that I'm using to look at parasitic versus free living to try and understand what the differences are between those sort of life lifestyles. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, related question to the evolution of this parasitic lifestyle. Um, do you have any thoughts as to what would be the selective pressures uh, favoring the adoption of this parasitic lifestyle? Um, do you mean um, if they develop into parasites straight away or if they go into the free No, no, the question is these ones were just presumably free living nematodes happily existing in soil or water or whatever their environment was. And then at some point they become parasites. So, um, and, and they have done so several times over during the evolution of this clade. So, Clearly, there's some um, strong advantage or um, re a, a very um, repeated um, opportunities and contact with hosts that uh, allow them to hook into this um, parasitic lifestyle. Yeah, so in nematodes, parasitism has evolved a number of times, maybe 10 or more times, probably more, more nematodes we actually discover and find and, and research. Um, is independently evolved a number of times. And that's across all of the different evolutionary clades and nematodes as well. So there obviously seems to be some, um, some selection pressure that, that is, is driven, driving these worms to evolve in that way. And if you look at parasites, or you look at animals more generally, a huge proportion of animals are actually parasitic or have some form of, of parasitism in their life cycle. Okay, so we have a number of questions which are a lot more uh, molecular um, in tone. So um, Monica Wendy is asking, how many wagos do these um, worms have? They have, I can't remember exactly, but it's around 22 or 23. Oh, wag so, so 22 or 23 argonauts, wagos um, around about six, six or seven. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, David Greek Fuem uh, is um, asking whether you saw upregulation or downregulation of uh, PIRNAs. Um, 
And uh, he says that he had issues with um, part of your talk with the internet connection. So he apologizes if you already mentioned that. So actually, strongyloides don't have pi RNA. So, um, so, so the more we, my group, other groups are investigating the types of small RNAs that are present in nematodes. We find that uh, so C. elegans and C. elegans relate, closely related nematodes to C. elegans in this clade five um, of, of nematodes. They have, they seem to have pi RNAs, or at least the Cenorhabditis C- C- species do. Um, outside of that, actually, most nematodes don't have pi RNAs, and Strongyloides is one of them. So we haven't actually seen any evidence for pi RNA, and they don't have the argonaut. That, they don't seem to have a copy of the argonaut that would coincide with that in C. elegans. So Sulema Garcia is asking um, if you could explain in a bit more detail the um, association between the receptors and the um, complement um, in the immune response to strongyloids. So actually, at the moment, we all we know is that we've got these siRNAs that's secreted by the parasite, and we know they're secreted into the rat host, or at least in ex vivo, we're finding that. And we've just used bioinformatics to take those sequences of siRNA and try to predict what genes they're targeting in the rat. So we found a couple of genes that relate to the complement pathway seem to be targeted by multiple, uh, by not just one siRNA, by multiple siRNAs are targeting these these couple of genes. Other than that, we don't really know anything else. So we're actually, we're working in collaboration with uh, Mason Labai, also at the University of Bath, and we're going to investigate these, um, he, he works on complement, he's, he's specialised in complement pathways. And so we're actually going to start doing some experiments to understand exactly how this is working. So we'll hopefully find out some more information about that. Okay, so um, Danae Roy Ruiz is asking whether, if you were to deactivate these small RNAs, um, in the parasites, um, would they then not be able to infect the host? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so what we're working on at the moment is we, what we're planning to do, we hope to do, is to actually knock out the argonauts. So rather than, if you try and, if you try and get rid of a single small RNA, whether it's siRNA or microRNA, because you often have multiple small RNAs are targeting the same gene, um, you might get some compensatory effects, so you might not really see any difference. So what we want to do is we want to try to knock out argonaut, the genes coding for these different argonaut proteins, and see if that way we can understand what was happening a bit better. See if, if that actually, so in C. elegans, for example, if you um, if you knock down one of the argonaut proteins, you tend to see that the small RNAs associated with that argonaut protein are also reduced. So we're hoping that we can do something similar in strongyloides. And because strongyloides is one of the very few parasitic nematodes where things like CRISPR-Cas9 and RNAi have been developed, we're hoping that actually we have an advantage to really look in that in more detail in strongyloides. Thank you. So Cesar Vivar is asking um, a little bit about what you were telling us um, earlier in your talk, that um, these parasites can manipulate um, the host so, um, Cesar Vivar is asking how do these uh, parasites influence the decision making in the host and whether there's any similarity at all with um, some of the processes that are observed with uh, fungi. And he's um, uh, writing an example with which is the cordyceps. Okay, so these, so our parasites, they, um, so they, at the adult stage, they remain as such. They move through body tissues. They don't actually, as far as we're aware, they don't um, enter the brain or the central nervous system, for example, unless it's a very serious systemic infection, which is very rare. So we, there's, uh, whether there's any direct influence on the brain or something like that that some parasites might have. However, one thing that's associated with soil transmitted helminths is that there's a, an impaired cognitive ability of people. So they find this often in groups of school children they look at that there's um, that their co- their ability to uh, developmental ability and cognition is actually impaired by having these gut parasites. And so we think maybe that that's something to do with the sort of the gut brain um, axes so that maybe that could be involved. And we don't really know much about that in terms of the parasitic worms. A lot more has been done of that in terms of the microbiome. And we know that the microbiome can actually influence behavior in that way. And so, um, so something we could look into potentially is looking to see how these parasites might do that and whether or not it's direct from the parasite 
or is it, as we know, these parasites, they live inside your gut and they actually change your microbiome. So is it actually the effect of the microbiome that's changing that may cause some cognitive impairment? They don't, um, um, but they don't, they don't seem to have any, uh, any sort of intentional change in behavior. So they don't manipulate behavior as such. Okay, thank you. Um, so Gerardo Corral Ruiz is asking us um, how the ELV impacts the host immune response affecting mucus production. Um, no, actually, he's saying that you talked a little bit about that, but he is interested in how the parasite is interacting with the microbiome um, in the gut of the host whether you know of any interactions, and if not, could you speculate a bit? So we have some previous work we did, um, so when I was in Taizé Kikuchi's lab in Japan, a uh, oh. microbiome of, uh, of, of mice infected with Strongyloides venus valensis. We found that actually during infection, there was a change in microbiomes. The di actually, the diversity of the microbiome was reduced during the peak of infection. And this actually, the microbiome recovered after infection or towards the end of infection, actually recovered to the sort of pre-infection state. Um, depending on, different studies have found different results in terms of the, how microbiome changes during a parasite. And there seem to be many different variables. So for example, we've just, we've done, just conducted another experiment in the lab at the moment looking at the microbiome. And we found a slightly different pattern that the microbiome stay, seems very stable, but at the sort of mid stage of infection, there's a big change. And I think there's so many factors involved, and there's also been a lot of studies looking at uh, where you have a host that's wild versus a host that's laboratory based as well, and finding different results. And, and so I think, yeah, there, there's, there's definitely, a, without a doubt, having a gut parasite change the microbiome. Um, and it certainly seems to increase or decrease certain types of bacteria, but there's still a lot of variables that are being investigated. Thank you. So we have another question from David Greg uh, Hoeme, and he's asking, why is it that you can't use CRISPR in most nematodes? Um, I'm not entirely sure, <laughs> is my answer. So it's not something I worked on. It's something that I'm planning to, planning to do in the future. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, so obviously it's well established in C. elegans now. Um, and there's a couple of big labs that have really worked to get it working in strongyloides. I'm, I, I don't know, actually. It's not really my expertise to know why it's not working very well. But um, normally, I think if we keep working at something, we'll get it working eventually. It's just sort of trial and error figuring it out. But luckily for us, strongyloides, it, it seems to be working. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, another question relating to um, the climate change and how you think it, it is or will affect the um, global distribution of strongoloides. And if you could um, just remind us what is the current um, distribution of these parasites and um, whether you expect any changes. So strongyloides, the, the so the human parasite, there's two species, one found mostly in Papua New Guinea. The other one is found across the world in tropical and subtropical regions. Um, and for the strongyloides stercoralis is the most common human parasite. It affects around up to, up to 350 million people. And then, of course, you have the wider group of soil transmitted helminths that are also found in a similar distribution across the world. So one of the major factors in their life cycle and their ability to transmit between hosts is that they need they have this free living stage that needs some kind of water to, to move between hosts so that they can swim between different hosts and come into contact with their host. So I guess that actually uh, one of the one important factor in climate change is actually how will climate change affect these the, the water situation in streets and areas. Um, a, a big problem is with parasitic nematode infections is sanitation. So where the, the sanitation is poorer and you have these, these where uh, fecal matter might be able to mix in with water in, in the streets, for example, you're more likely to have a bigger problem. So I'd imagine that actually that might be a factor in climate change. So depending on how climate change changed the environment and water, for example, whether that's increased rainfall or drying up water areas as well, that could have a direct impact on the ability of these nematodes to transmit between hosts. Okay, so once a host is infected, is the um, infection chronic um, and can it be treated? 
Um, yeah, so it, it varies a lot, actually. So in strongyloides, you have, um, so if a healthy healthy person got infected with strongyloides, it would normally, uh, you can normally clear it on your own if it's sort of a one-off infection. In many situations, people are living in environments where they're repeatedly infected. So um, the human parasite can also auto infect. So once it's inside the small intestine, it can actually keep that cycle of infection going. Um, the, um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So an immunocompromised host or someone that might have had a transplant, for instance, where they're taking immunosuppressants, that's when then when the strong noise infection is much more likely to be become systemic and much more serious then. So overall, these parasites, they don't, their, their fatality rate, and the same for most soil transmitted helminths, is relatively low. And this is probably why they maybe got not so much attention as something like malaria. But actually, when you look at the years lost due to disability and these estimates of disease burden, they're really high. So they can really impair your quality of life, including cognition, as I mentioned, but also general quality of life, although they might not necessarily be. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of questions from Estela Lopez Corona. So she's saying that you seem to know a lot about uh, your research, and she's really impressed about that. Um, and she's saying that um, she would like to know how is it that the um, nematode is sort of abusing the uh, metabolic the metabolism of the of the host. Yeah, um, and, and sorry. And her second question is, how did you decide? to study, I guess, nematodes and, uh, and their um, molecular basis of uh, parasitism. Um, so uh, in terms of metabolism, so how they might be exploiting the metabolism of the host. So the nematodes, these nematodes, strongyloides, they actually feed on bacteria um, inside the host. They don't, we don't think that they're actually feeding directly off the host tissue. Um, so they sort of burrow through the mucosa and they live in there. So I'm not sure how they may directly affect the metabolism of the host or not. I'm not sure about that. Um, the reason for studying them is actually, the honest answer is that after my PhD, I was looking for a postdoc position. I couldn't find one in the area that I wanted to work in, which was entomology at the time. So I applied for a job to work on parasitic nematodes because I was interested in, in sort of infection biology more generally. Um, and then uh, ended up working in Mark Viney's lab in, at the University of Bristol. And that completely changed my what I wanted to work on. Actually, I just I I think I think one of the, the things that attracted to me to me to these worms was that it had these genetically identical parasitic and free living stages. I thought that was really exciting, actually. And also, worms are really quite cute when you look at them down the microscope. I could spend hours looking at them with the microscope. So that was that was another a deal clencher for me. <laughs> okay, I wasn't expecting that. So you find them pretty. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so um, um, for uh, everybody uh, here, uh, Vicky is an avid um, and very active on Twitter. She goes by the um, name of Nematode Girl, so if anybody's interested in following her work at the University of Bath, then do follow her account on Twitter. And um, Estela Lopez Corona is again asking, What's next for the um, nematode girl? <laughs> um, uh, more, more work on small RNAs, I think. It's, it, I think now we're starting to do some, uh, some new work in the lab where we want to really focus in on what these small RNAs are targeting and also hopefully try and establish, in the long run, try and establish some, uh, some genetic um, modifications of CRISPR Cas9 or RNAi, I think, would be the long term plan. Okay, so I think that's uh, everything from the questions. I can't, I'm struggling to get the uh, to the end of the chat uh, feed, so just um, one second. But um, so we have an extra question about um, extracellular vesicles and um, whether they have a role in masking or deceiving the immune system and whether those small RNAs might actually be transported and having an effect in the host 
cells? And this is a question by um, Catalina Rodriguez, and I think uh, that will now very much be the last question. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so that's our hypothesis. We think that these, these extracellular vesicles are packed full of these peptidases and small RNAs, and they're secreted into the host. We don't know for sure if they're uptaken by the host cell yet, so that's something we still need to investigate. But we, our hypothesis is that they're, they're there to uh, manipulate the host environment. And that, that includes the immune response. Um, so, for example, genes involved in the complement system and the estrogen receptors that we meant that I mentioned in the talk, that we think that they're targeting things like that to directly manipulate this environment. So that's something that we're really focusing on now and we're investigating further. Okay, Vicky, thank you very much. It was an amazing talk. And uh, I think your work is quite interesting and I'm amazed at um, all the different things and results that you're getting. Um, so thank you a lot for sharing those with us. So um, all that's left uh, from me is to say thank you to um, everybody in the consortium uh, of the um, universities for science um, that are supporting us and participating and sharing all details about the events that we do. In particular, um, we need to make special mention to um, the Fundación UNAM, um, who is um, uh, tirelessly supporting us um, in these uh, efforts, and also Colegio Nacional, which um, is uh, very generously sharing all the uh, platforms and also helping us to coordinate um, these um, events. So I would like to once more um, uh, remind you of uh, the uh, next uh, talk in the series that would be next Tuesday at the same time as today's talk. Uh, it will be uh, by uh, Chris Lowery from the University of Texas in Austin and he will be talking about the recovery of life of the, the um, KPG uh, mass extinction. So um, I say goodbye to you um, um, in my name, obviously, but also in the name of uh, Dr. Martin Serrano and uh, Professor Matthew uh, Wills, who were unable to join us um, today, but obviously would have, would have very much wanted to be here uh, with us. So um, back to uh, Dr. Jaime Rutia and also uh, Licenciado Dionisio Mi uh, for some uh, final words. Thank you. Um uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks uh, for um, a very impressive uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, this is a very important work and it's uh, uh, interesting uh, the power of these new molecular biology tools and this uh, combination with uh, uh, genomics and uh, genetics. With uh, 1.5 billion people infected, uh, well, this is uh, uh, certainly uh, something we really need to investigate uh, more. So thanks very much, uh, uh, Vicky. It's a pleasure having you here. And uh, uh, we remember that uh, you came uh, uh, last year to visit the uh, UNAM, the university. So we will be uh, looking forward for your uh, next, uh, for your coming uh, visit. Um, uh, muchas gracias a todos uh, por uh, uh, acompañarnos. Uh, y uh, uh, este es un uh, problema uh, de salud, un estudio muy interesante que muestra la capacidad de investigación que tenemos este, ahora usando las, eh, las técnicas de biología molecular, de genética, de genómica eh, y la capacidad que se tiene ahora de investigación. La doctora eh, Vicky Hunt eh, eh, colabora también con eh, investigadores en la ULAM, con eh, Araxi y con otros eh, grupos y ha venido este, a México este, eh, a visitar a la universidad este, la última el año, el año pasado, so esperamos que eh, mantengamos esta colaboración, que es una parte sustancial eh, muy importante para Fundación, eh, Fundación UNAM. Eh, les invitamos eh, eh, a la plática también de esta tarde sobre comportamientos eh, eh, de los átomos a las eh, sociedades en el Colegio a las seis, y el jueves tenemos una presentación de un documental de divulgación científica en los eh, buques oceanográficos de la UNAM, el buque Justo Sierra y las investigaciones en el Golfo de, 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 de México. Y eh, con esto eh, 
pues, eh, y nuevamente destacando el papel y el orgullo que tenemos de contar con la Fundación UNAM en la universidad y en el país, le pasamos eh, la palabra a nuestro presidente de Fundación UNAM, eh, Dionisio Min. Muchas gracias. Eh, muchas gracias, Jaime. It was really a great lecture. Millions of people are affected. for you sharing with your knowledge on this important title. Nos sentimos muy contentos en Fundación UNAM de acreditar que este esfuerzo no reconoce fronteras en el conocimiento, cómo podemos hoy compartir como nunca lo que cada quien sabe, lo que cada, lo que cada quien está haciendo, lo que cada quien está investigando. Y por eso el formidable potencial de este consorcio de universidades que está haciendo más y más por regresar a la humanidad en la búsqueda de un mundo mejor. Gracias, Jaime. Thank you very much, Vicky. Gracias, Araxi. Es, es un muy, muy gran esfuerzo el que estamos haciendo. Gracias al Colegio Nacional y a los demás integrantes de este consorcio de universidades, universidades por la ciencia, que como hoy se acredita, están haciendo un gran esfuerzo para mejorar las condiciones de salud de la humanidad. Buenas tardes a todos y estaremos pendientes de las próximas pláticas para participar también con todo interés y con todo entusiasmo. Buenas tardes a todos.